burn hot, die young. That's what a lot of people say in a colloquial sense, right? If you eat a lot of food and you burn a lot of calories, then, well, you're burning a lot and you're gonna burn hot and die young. Well, it's not quite that simple. It's actually the opposite. Now, when you look at how caloric restriction could potentially play a role in longevity, it's not just about this simple, like, thermogenic thing. It's not that, oh, well, you're burning so many calories, it's, it's heat and not, no, that's very simple. And although it makes sense, it actually is more about the stressor that comes as a result of caloric restriction. So sure, having less fuel overall in your body can play a role and play a role just in how much you know, less you're burning and contributing to reactive oxygen species and things like that. But what we're really looking at is caloric restriction as an additive. So what do I mean, caloric restriction as an additive? It's the benefits and secondary effects that we get from caloric restriction that have potential longevity effects, not just the absence of calories as a simple fuel. So let's go ahead and jump into this. After today's video, you can save 25% off your entire first grocery order from Thrive Market. Okay, now Thrive Market is just like your grocery store, except everything has been vetted. It's all better for you options, and it's easy to sort by different diet type and category. So, uh, if you wanted to do autoimmune paleo or paleo, or if you're fasting, or if you're doing keto, or if you're plant-based, you just sort by diet type, and then you get all your groceries delivered to your doorstep based upon how you shop. So that link down below, because they are a sponsor on today's video, is going to save you 25% off your whole first grocery order, plus you get a free gift. So check out Thrive Market down below in the description. So the first thing we look at is something called mitochondrial hormesis, okay? Hormesis is just that, it's a hormetic stressor. When you exercise, when you go to the gym, when you do any kind of workout, you are creating a stress within your body and your body adapts to it. What people don't realize is that caloric restriction stresses the body. Now, when you calorically restrict, the cells have to become more efficient. So that stressor that you place on the mitochondria allows what is called FOXO3 to ultimately trigger adaptations to where the mitochondria gets stronger. Now, just to put things in simple terms, if you look at someone that is exercising a lot, a lot, a lot, intense exercise, they're gonna have a better life expectancy than someone that's sedentary. However, someone that moderately exercises is going to have better life expectancy than someone that exercise intensely. What that means is that too much of an oxidative stressor is going to be a bad thing, but just enough is a good thing. So with caloric restriction, it's not just about the cumulative how many calories you eat over the course of a lifetime. It's about the occasional caloric restriction that inflicts the stress upon your body to adapt. Now, if we look at it in a very remedial way, we would say, well, let me just be in a slight deficit every single day. If you were in a slight deficit every single day, think about it, your metabolism would come to a halt and it would slow down to adjust to that. And that's not necessarily the best thing either. So you need periodic times of caloric restriction and periodic times of maintenance and periodic times of slight surplus to balance things out as far as weight management goes, but just enough deficit days to, I don't know, allow you to tap into these benefits. If I had to put a number on it, I would say be in a deficit three or four days a week and be in a slight surplus the other days. You can look at your calories over the course of a week, right? You don't have to say, I'm consuming 2,500 calories every day for seven days. No, you can consume 2,000 calories one day, 3,000 calories the next. Look at how it aggregates over the course of a week, and it can help you out in terms of a longevity sort of quality of life mechanism and calculation. The other way that caloric restriction plays such a role with longevity and aging has to do with what is called mTOR. Now, what is mTOR? Now, mTOR we can look at in a much more granular scale, in a shorter time frame. Every time you consume something, you are spiking mTOR. Now, mTOR is pro-growth. Too much mTOR is obviously a problem, right? Too much growth could potentially mean growth of tissues we don't want, growth of fat, growth of, heck, even tumors, right? We don't want too much mTOR, although a balance of having the right amount of mTOR for building and recovery is important. But the opposite of mTOR is essentially the downstream effects of FOXO3, right? So 
when you put yourself in a deficit, you are inhibiting mTOR. So you are inhibiting these growth phases, which could be detrimental to your longer term quality of life. So essentially, it's allowing regeneration to occur at a slightly faster rate. Okay? The other piece of caloric restriction when it comes down to aging and longevity is something called AMPK. Okay, now maybe you've heard of metformin being used in aging research. Metformin is a pharmaceutical that is typically used for type 2 diabetics. What it allows in a type 2 diabetic is for glucose to be taken up by the cell in people that normally have a hard time taking glucose up, right? They, they, insulin function, just their cells are resistant to it. So uh, by elevating AMPK with metformin, it allows that glucose to go into a cell. That's why it's also looked at in terms of aging, because AMPK does seem to have be playing a role when it comes to aging. So AMPK is an energy sensor within the body. So when you're in a deficit, your body may say, uh-oh, there is more demand for energy than what's available right now. So that means that the body has to start getting scrappy. So it starts wrangling up excess glucose. It starts wrangling up free fatty acids and it finds ways to use those for fuel. Well, the phosphorylation of AMPK also has positive downstream effects when it comes down to well, health in the body and overall longevity. One of the things that we see in the longer term research is that chronic exposure to high levels of blood glucose is not exactly good, right? Can lead to insulin resistance, can lead to all kinds of other issues. If we periodically put ourselves in a deficit through a couple different ways, which I'll explain in a second, we can drive that risk potentially down. The cool thing about AMPK is it implies that you can put yourself in a deficit in a couple of different ways. You could simply eat less and trigger AMPK to be phosphorylated, or you could exercise and literally burn more than you are consuming at a literal point in time. So if I were to be fasted because I just woke up and I worked out, AMPK would elevate because there's not fuel available that I ate. So it would elevate and activate AMPK, phosphorylate AMPK, and I would get the benefits there. So you see what I'm saying? It's not about just eating less and having less impact on the body. It's about the additive effect of what eating less does. Now this next component is a little bit more directly related with fuel, okay? This is what is called NAD. NAD stands for nicotinamide adenide dinucleotide, okay? And what it is is it's an electron carrier. So when we take food, when we eat food, our body breaks that food down ultimately into electrons, okay? And these electrons have to get pulled through a specific gradient. They have to get pulled through the mitochondrial membrane to ultimately go through what's called the electron transport chain to create energy. That sounds complicated and ultimately it kind of is, so we don't need to go into the gory details there. But to transfer glucose and to transfer electrons into a cell to be used as fuel, that NAD needs to turn into what's called NADH, okay? So when NAD turns into NADH, NAD is utilized. Not a problem, right? That's what it's supposed to do. But if you require less NAD because you are eating less, you have more spare NAD available. Okay, cool. What does spare NAD do? Well, spare NAD has another job that it can go do. Okay, I want you to think of it as someone that is totally like ADD and can't sit still. And if you were to say, hey, you don't have any glucose to deal with right now or electrons to transfer, uh, it's not just gonna sit there idle, it's gonna find something to do. So what NAD does is it goes and it activates something called a sirtuin. Now, a lot of the research from Dr. David Sinclair and that whole world really is uncovering that sirtuins activate these different longevity processes within the body. Okay, can also have an effect on FOXO3, but that's kind of in its earlier stages, but it can also trigger a lot of repair in other ways. And now we're starting to see research that sirtuins can potentially suppress inflammation too. So it's easy to look at, say, like the Okinawans and say, oh, well, they're in a deficit all the time and that's why they have high degree of longevity. They're probably not in a deficit every day, right? Because think about how a deficit would work. That would imply that they are continually eating less and less and less and less every single day or every week or every month, right? Because eventually your body adapts. So eventually they'd just be fasting, right? Of course they have some days where they're in a surplus. 
The Okinawans, when you start looking at the blue zones, you look at Costa Rica, you look at things like that, it's diversity to their diet, high amounts of fiber, and periodic deficits, and overall just less food. Because if you're eating too much food, then yes, that is going to be a reactive oxygen species uh, antagonist, I guess you could call it, in another way. Just by creating so much exhaust in your body, if you want to call it that, from metabolizing fuel, that you end up with waste that your body has to deal with. So it's all a balance. Surplus, deficit. But it's not the simple mere fact of reducing calories that has the effect. It's the secondary effects. And that's where the research is starting to get interesting. How do we affect those biomarkers outside of just caloric restriction? As always, I'll see you tomorrow.